Well, welcome everyone. It's great to see you. Um, let's just go around and you can say who you are and uh, let us know if there's anything. And there's Ellen. Hi, Ellen. We just got started. Um, yeah, so we'll go around and then, um, and especially let us know if there's anything particular you'd like to talk about today. Questions, issues, whatever, okay? So I'm Susan Walker, formerly from the University of Minnesota, now of the world. And I will turn it over to Nancy. And I'm Nancy Trahey. I am um, hmm, semi-retired, I guess you could say. I'm just doing parent ed for my school district, Albany School District in Central Minnesota. And I will turn it over to Jennifer. Hello, I'm Jennifer Wenner, and I'm in parent ed in the Minnetonka School District. And I have a question for the group, um, if we get to it today, about um, pricing of classes on the sliding scale um, for registration. So, and I will turn it over to um, Abby. Hi, everyone. Um, I am pumping, so that's why I'm muted and my camera off, but um, I teach parent ed in Wilmer. Um, and I guess this week, um, I was kind of curious about what, what you guys cap your classes at as far as how many families you allow in um, at a time. And those of you that have been teaching a while, what, what do you feel like a good number is for a cap? And I will go to Becca if she's back. I'm back, but I don't know what the questions were. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we're just, share just sharing if we had any questions this week and who we are. I'm Becca. I'm a parent educator for um, District 622, which is North St. Paul, Oakdale, Maplewood. Um, I don't think I have a question today. Just kind of trying to get everything in. Who hasn't gone yet? Jenny, you're up. Hi, everybody. I'm Jenny Thompson. I work in the St. Paul schools at the Belvedere Westside site. And um, I'm just here. I, I don't have a specific question. I just feel like if I have free hour, I need to be here and learn from all of you. So, and I'm going to be eating lunch and multitasking. So I might have my video off, but I'm here listening. Jenny, do you want to call on, um, you have Ellen or Katie? Katie, you want to go? <clears throat> All right, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Okay, um, I'm Katie Anderson. I am teach parent ed in the Jordan School District. And um, the only thing I would ask is, has anybody taught a lesson on the five love languages by Dr. Chapman for his book? Um, if you have, I'd be open to hearing any insight you have. Um, it's not really, really pressing. So if we don't get to it, totally fine. Just something on my radar. So um, glad to be here today. Over to you, Ellen. Hello. Um, can you hear me? Okay, good. It said something about unmuting and I couldn't read it. I'm Ellen Hafner. I'm a parent educator in Northfield. I'm on my way home. Be there in about five minutes. Um, and Katie, I will send you a lesson plan. I'll put it in the chat in a little bit um, when I get home. But I do not have any questions today. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, let's just do a quick check in though about um, those of you who have been with me before know that when I do my teaching, um, I oftentimes will ask just to get sort of a pulse on things, a uh, crappy to happy scale, one to seven. And um, uh, with uh, one being that you're, you're kind of feeling crappy today um, or seven up to seven, you know, that you're feeling happy. So um, you can just write it in chat or hold your hand up or whatever, um, kind of where you're at today. 
from one to seven. Again, one being crappy, seven being happy. Oh, Jennifer's a six. Oh, Becca's a three. Five, six, six, three, seven. Oh, Nancy. Nice. Very nice. Jenny, how about, oh, Jenny's a six. So we have a few sixes, fives. Abby's a seven. Nancy's a seven. Okay, Becca. We'll get to our list, but let's check in. You're kind of at a three today. Is there any way we can help you or support you? Um, yeah, I need, I need my own parent ed group where I'm not the parent educator for um, elementary school kids weren't doing well. So, uh, yeah, my nine-year-old is very much not doing well. And that whole hurt people, hurt people thing um, applies to him. And I'm worried about him becoming the bully and stuff like that. So mm. it's really hard as a parent to feel like you're doing everything you can and it's not enough. Yep. So things feel heavy and they have for a little while. That's why I wasn't here last week. Yeah. Oh, Becca. Well, I'll say for myself and just seeing a couple other people's reactions that um, while we may not have the specific situation you're going through, um, I think for those of us, as we work with parents, we too have felt like, in fact, I just said it to my husband last night, right? You do your best, but you're never quite sure if it's the right thing. Like, I just want a professional, like along the way to say, do this, do this, and then there will be this outcome. <laughs> I I can't remember you who want that. Was. Oh, sorry, Jen. Sorry. Jen, oh, I, I'll just take it. You want that crystal ball to peek it, like you know they're going to be fine, but you just would really love to have that little crystal ball to see them, and they're like they're they're fine. They're going to do fine, but we just have to trust. I can't, Becca, it might've even been you a couple of weeks, maybe it's been three or four weeks ago now who talked about feeling like, um, uh, you know, as a parent educator that you were, I, I sometimes I feel like I'm a bit of a fraud, right? And I, I tell my parents, nobody's a perfect parent for the parents that are in my classes, I should say, not my own parents. <laughs> um, but, but sometimes I feel like I'm not you know, I'm hard on myself and feel like I'm not doing a good job as well. I, I agree with Susan. I think we do the best we can. And uh, so we need to give ourselves some grace as well. Um, with our with one of our children, there were lots of times when he was living at home where we felt like, gosh. Um, so I, I empathize with what you're going through. And I, and I hope you have good resources around you. Uh, good support resources. Not, not, not so much, huh? Some of what we're working on um, because of the pandemic and how great student need is across the board um, and the mass flight of um, professionals from the field um, and staffing issues, um, getting things taken care of for mental health in elementary schools is really hard right now. Um, and teachers are overwhelmed. And my kiddo desperately needs a 504 or an IEP. And I know I'm his advocate and we need to push to make it happen, but it's hard when there's just not um, the people on the school's end or they're overworked and have no time. Um, we did just get paperwork in this morning for he has five diagnoses is that enough like but it's really hard because he is probably he's nine he in third grade probably at a sixth or seventh grade level for academics so he's not struggling academically um and thus isn't a real concern but he's beating people up on the plane um so there's a lot going on he has ADHD, anxiety, depression, sensory processing disorder, and oppositional defiance. Like Becca, 
I'm sure it feels really hard for you when um, you're going through these things at home and then you have to put on a smile and go help people with potty training. I, you know, I, and we've talked about this before in this group, but you know, a lot of times there's things happening in our own lives and, you know, sometimes it's hard to go and be positive and help families with things that you think might, you know, are just minuscule compared to what you're going through right now. So just, I'm, I feel so sorry, Becca, cause you're so happy and bubbly and to see you like that makes me really sad. So I'm thinking of you and praying for you and hope you get some help. Thank you. I'm still happy and bubbly and cheerful and on for my families. I think most of them would have no idea if something was going on. Um, yeah, but that's, that's hard. Having too, years of my own issues has gotten me really great at masking. Um, yeah. But yes, that's why like last week I was like, I didn't even have the energy for this group, which is such a support and a wonderful place for me to be, but I'm used up. Um, with all that. So it's, yeah, it's exhausting. And I, I think your experience as a parent educator is a gift for you as a parent and your son, because you, you, you know, that hanging in there and um, keeping going, you know, continuing through the struggles, there will be a, a brighter day ahead. Like uh, like Ellen was saying, the long term picture, you're more familiar with it than some parents might be. Yeah, knowing you too, Becca, and you know people in this group, is that balance of sort of not withholding any information about ourselves, which then sort of places this sympathetic expert kind of thing. And then kind of that oversharing about our personal stuff that is like, well, who the heck are you to be a parenting educator when you have all these questions, you know? And, but I think that that being authentic with our, of ourselves and our own struggles and having our own sort of intuitive sense of that sort of little compass dial that is like, oh, I'm oversharing, coming back. You know, <laughs> you know, or this is a, or coming over here, this is a good opportunity for me to go. I understand. Like, I also have a child or I have experience with whatever. Right. And again, it's just that being attuned with our, our parents and our, our, um, our group to know, but I would very much guess that whatever level of authenticity and sharing that you are offering, right. Um, if anything bonds you to your group even better, right? Because they know that this is lived experience for you, that you're not passing judgment on them. And if anything, right. <laughs> yeah. And, but if anything, you're facilitating the process that you are a part of. Well, thank you, Becca, for um, responding to my, my uh, <laughs> question about your threeness. Um, is there anything else that we can do or say? Um, how about if we all give Becca a big virtual hug? <laughs> Here we are hugging you, hon. Thank you. you bet. Um, Okay, well, let's go to our list. Um, and one of the first questions came up. A couple of these are practical ones that all kind of fit in together um, in terms of like pricing on classes if you have sliding scale, and then also related to like class size. And if you're capping a class, when what is a good cap? So just let's have at it. And what is your experience with those? We cap our toddler classes at eight. Um, we used to cap them at 10, but we had a slightly bigger room. We had a room that was long and skinny and now our room is much more square. Um, so noises, like if I did parent time away at the end of this long skinny room and if they were at the other side, it just was quieter and it's just not the case anymore. So um, eight for toddlers, 
And then our um, mixed age group and my baby class, I don't cap. I have 10 right now in my three to 12 month class, but we just sit on a, on the carpet and we don't move much. And then our two and a half to five, which we have very few fives, mostly four is the preschool age. Um, we have 13 in each class only because we had waiting lists, but typically we kept those at 12. We have gone up to 15, <laughs> but that was for families who had two kids. Like a couple of years ago, pre-COVID, we had a lot of families bringing a three, you know, a two and a half year old and a four year old or a three year old and a five year old. So, um, but 15 is big. Yeah. So 12 just seems to be 12, 13 is like, it's a sweet spot for us. Yeah. Similar. We kept um, our classes at 12 kids. So if there's like twins, like it counts as, as 12 kids. Um, we have kind of a big enough children's space for it. Um, but on a day when all 12 kids and parents are there, that's, um, it's boisterous. So um, we don't have very many classes that actually hit that kind of happily. Um, 10 seems like a really good number because any given week someone's not there and then you still have a healthy um, number of people for making it feel abundant and festive. Uh, in St. Paul, we have very similar. Um, I would just add that um, we have a lot of birth to five classes and those are at 12, but that if um, if there's a family that wants to add and sometimes we go up to 13 or so. And then also we, um, sorry, lost track of my thought, but they, they do some flexibility around, like if a family wants to add and they've got two kids and they send it over. Kind of thing. So there's a lot of working with families to figure out what they need. I think we have um, most of our classes capped at 12, but I think we might have a couple that are actually capped at 15. Um, that to me is too many. <laughs> um, but we have a history in our district of being um, really, really low enrollment. So my administrators really flow to want to put a kid up on anything. Um, it's just like, if they want to come, we'll make space for them. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. But I would agree that a perfect class size for me is probably around 10, eight to 10, depending on the actual individual. But um, I, I love having had several classes with really few families. I really love having a full class but more than 12 is really hard to even just physically manage, much less just like making sure everybody has the time and attention that they deserve to have in a group. Yeah, we have 15 as our cap right now. And every day after class, the early childhood teacher and I are like, what just happened? <laughs> it seems so chaotic. And that's why we were curious. And then I had a kind of a question off of that, that maybe you guys can answer. How many like birth to five ECFE classes do you offer in a week? How many sessions? We all, our birth to five classes only at night. The rest of ours are all age specific. We have one birth to five, it's daytime and always full, always full. We have, um, ours are not birth, to five, but um, 12 months to five, just kind of given the space we have, um, the, the physical space. And we have um, one in the evening, one on a Saturday, and one on a Wednesday morning. And the Wednesday morning one um, is usually really full because it's it's an option that basically any family could um, choose and they can bring more than one kid. You know, like someone else said, if they've got a two-year-old and a four-year-old, it's kind of fun to go with both kids. We have, I think, three, multi, one, two, four multi-age classes, um, two evening, but one of those evenings, one, ones is actually birth to eight, like through um, third graders. Uh, and then uh, we have infant class walkers and talkers and um, and a couple preschool age classes, like Ellen was talking about, there, like two and a half to five, um, where they're more likely, it's not such a small age range, there's more likely to be siblings in 
in those couple classes? Well, I'm going to say something really unpopular. I do not like multi-age classes. I do not like a birth to five class um, because what happens is the majority of the parents with the kid, the biggest gr group of kids takes over. And it is so hard to give the attention to the families who have kids of different ages. Um, this happened pretty consistently with me with my evening class where I had quite a few three and four-year-olds and those parents wouldn't shut up. <laughs> And I kept saying, what about our toddler families? What about our baby families? Do you have any questions? It was so hard. And I was constantly like, okay, toddler and baby families, file this away for later. Um, it just got really hard. Those older parents were really dominating. And maybe that was more on me, but I just, I just don't, I don't like them. We'll do them. I'll do them because I have to. But if I can be, if I can do an age specific one, I'll do it in a heartbeat over a, a multi-age. And I think the other problem with that is for our multi-age class, we don't separate the babies in our program. We don't separate until kids are two and a half. So my early childhood teacher takes the big kids and they go play somewhere else in the building. And then the, the, if they're the, these are all daycare kids, right? So most of them separate pretty well. Um, and then the toddlers and babies stay with us. And I get one, I have my one EA. So she kind of watches them, but the parents are focused on their babies. Um, so that it works, but also it's not totally non-separating. Um, so anyway, it's just, it's tricky, but anyway, they're not my favorite. They never have been. So Ellen, do you think that explains why the parents of the older kids are, um, more dominating in the conversation because their children are out of the room? It's entirely possible, but yeah. I also just think it's, if there are six kids over the age of three, the conversations are going to be pretty heavily centered around three plus stuff. Right. Okay. And the same thing would happen if, if the, if I had a room of toddlers, if I had six toddlers in that group and three parents with four or five-year-olds, the majority of the conversation is going to be focused around toddler age topics. Do you know what I mean? Just because that's the majority of the parents asking questions. Does that make sense? So I Oh, yeah. I, have no, a, reason I think why maybe it doesn't happen during my class is because it's daytime. And so most mm -hmm. of the parents have multiple children. It's the only way they can come. Yeah. Uh, you know, anyway, I don't think. Yeah. And that's the same for ours. I mean, we have some families bringing two kids and I love that it's an option. I just, I really have a hard time keeping it equitable among for all of the age groups to get heard. Okay. Um, in St. Paul, I, I teach 10 classes and eight of them are multi-age. Um, I only have two that are birth, birth to two or birth to 12 months. And what's interesting is, so two of them are practiced for pre-K. So if the official enrollment is three to five-year-olds, but they can bring their younger siblings and we have a, a separate infant toddler room. So essentially the parents have all ages. And um, this is in my previous district in Roseville, they had a lot of age group classes, like a ones class and a twos class. So this is new to me to have all these birth to five classes. But what I find it actually, I kind of, Ellen, I have a not, I have a kind of an opposite experience, but in this, but they're all separating. So that, that makes a big difference, right? We're in the parent room. And then um, I've only been here since January, so I don't have the longest uh, longevity here to talk about it but so far I've just I always am picking topics that are very broad like we just did two weeks on supporting independence which can be adapted for any age um, I'm doing two weeks on temperament which obviously is any age so that has really helped when I have broader topics that um, match wherever you have baby to five um, but I know parents are really hungry for uh, especially an under two class um, I have a birth to two class that is um, all, all 10 months to 18 months. So they're all very similar in the development. And I think they get a lot from that combined or, or having parents of very similar ages. So, um, but if you don't have sibling care, then a lot of times they couldn't come, right? So it's, it's always tricky. I had eight years straight as a mom in a multi-age class and in St. Paul. And uh, I loved the multi-ageness of it. Uh, however, I had three kids, so that was a huge piece of it, um, and I really like teaching both. I think I employ quite a bit of what Jenny is talking about with my lesson plans 
being broader or me putting some really specific effort into, okay, we're talking about toileting. How does this apply to the nine month old who's not thinking about it yet? And how does this apply to the four year old who's actually been doing it really well for a couple of years already? Um, and people have stuff to share and and it connects with like, how do you prepare for this stage you're not at yet? Like it, even when it's an age specific topic, um, the parents who have already passed it probably find it a little less um, meaningful for themselves, but they also get the chance to kind of be the experts in that situation, which I think can really feel great to feel like, oh yeah, we got through this part of parenting. Um, so my experience has mostly been positive as a parent educator. I think from the early childhood point, it's an entirely different story. If you only have one early childhood teacher and one para, and they are trying to take care of babies and preschoolers in the same small room, like that is awful. It, it's just really, really challenging. So that's the big downside in my experience has been the part that I don't have to do um, is the early childhood teacher. Well, and I do all, you know what I mean? Like I do the whole, like, yeah, like last night it was potty. And I was like, okay, for those of you with babies, you know, here's how it applies to you. Honestly, though, my, my evening classes are kind of hot messes and that they have rapid fire questions that, and we rarely get to the topic. I only have 30 minutes with them. And that's where, that's where I'm finding that the questions just take over those big kids and the babies don't get the attention they need. So then I just spend one-on-one -on -one time. So I'm, I'm very, I would say I'm pretty good at that. Like, how does this apply to everybody? Um, it's just really when they're asking questions about discipline doesn't apply to the nine month olds yet, you know, and like potty and, you know, but even like eating and manners at the table, that doesn't really apply to the babies who aren't, are still breastfeeding, you know, and even around a bottle. So, I mean, I'm doing all of that. It's just, I feel bad for the parents. And I also have, I've had a mom in my evening class. She's going to be gone after this year. <laughs> she's so negative and she takes over and I'm, I'm just not, I'm not sad that she's moving on because she really dominates. And despite every effort I have to get her to stop complaining, um, it's really hard. So anyway, <laughs> I agree with Jenny's comment in the chat. Half an hour is not long enough for parenting time. You barely get through announcements and check-ins in half an hour. You, it, it's really hard to get to content. I, think I don't even do check-ins. We just go right to questions. Yeah. Well, the problem is parents can't get there before five o'clock or before 5.15. And we want them out of there by 6.30 because the babies are falling asleep. So we're 5.15 to 6.30. We figure it's better than nothing. But if we, we tried to go to seven, it was a nightmare. Those kids have been up since 6 a.m. They're just, they're exhausted. Mm -hmm. They're really, I mean, in a perfect world, there'd be no night class. It's not developmentally appropriate for those kids to be up until 7 30, 8 o'clock. That's my opinion. <laughs> and Jordan is pretty small, so we don't have any mixed age classes. We offer a baby class that's unfortunately not running. We've just had a real challenge getting baby classes to go here. Um, we have our ones and twos are definitely the most popular. We actually have two morning classes for ages one and two, and then we have an evening class. And then we also have a class that we call it preschool with training wheels. And it's, it's an ECFE class, but it's kind of a hybrid um, ECFE and preschool class. So it's two days a week for an hour and a half. And one morning is just an ECFE format where they come with their parent. And then the other day, they they get to be dropped off for an hour and a half of just child only time. Um, they have to just be three by February 1st. So they're a little bit younger. They're typically like threes, young threes, early fours, but that has really kind of taken off the past couple of years. It's a really neat, kind of a neat class. Um, they, they, the parents get, so if they do sib care, they get time with each child, you know, each, each day. So it's kind of a fun, way for the parents to get that one-on-one -on -one time with their kids but um yeah and we don't really cap we, we cap toddlers is probably like you know eight to ten 
And then the older, the preschool training wheels is like 10 to 12, but right now we have seven kids and that's the most we've had for that one. So we're building, building up after COVID and just things like that, so. So I have a general question about who decides. Um, how in your districts do you decide caps and classes, like whether you have a mixed age class or whether you have a specialized class, um, whether you have birth to three, birth to two, whatever. So I'm just curious how that decision making, Becca. <laughs> Okay, well, we know what Becca said. Um, so I am just, I'm just curious from district to district, um, because in a way, when I heard the question about like cap size, cap, you know, caps and stuff like that, I know it's a generic question for your district, but then that made me wonder, um, you know, like how, how do these numbers and classes get set in your districts? I think it's just kind of grandfathered in. They kind of figured out years ago what works and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the caps, we just like, yeah, that's, we're good. We don't need any more in terms of time and choosing. It's a team where we, we choose it as a team, our coordinator and, and teaching staff decide what we're going to do. And it's pretty much, we haven't changed it much. Um, so it's just kind of status quo. It's kind of been the same for a while, but if we were to change it up or change the schedule, that's our decision, which is fabulous. And the autonomy we have is incredible. And I'm really, really thankful for that. I know not everybody has that. And I really wish they did. We uh, we use parent feedback on the surveys at the end of the class, and and that uh, birth to five class that I talked about um, is always full. They requested uh, because they just felt half an hour wasn't enough parent talk time. So years ago, I mean, I've worked for the district twenty years now. So years and years ago, they said we need more time. So that and the community ed coordinator said okay, we can lengthen it, but the cost is going to go up. And I thought that was going to, that was going to kill the enrollment, but it didn't. And, and when I say we increased the parent talk time, it went to 45 minutes. And so I I'm jealous of what you have. Those of you that have an hour, that's really wonderful. When I was in Wisconsin and doing that nurturing program that I spoke of a couple of weeks ago, I had two hours with parents. I was so spoiled. Uh, that was a big shock for me getting here to Minnesota. And the early childhood teacher I worked with when I first started in our district um, said, you get 15 minutes with the parents. And I, I'm like, this, this, yeah, 15 minutes? No. Um, yeah, that's not going to work. But um, I had to wait till she was no longer there. It wasn't long to change it with then the other early childhood teachers. I think our district, our court, our just, our, excuse me, our community education director does a good job of looking for feedback from parents. And then otherwise she pretty much trusts us to give it, we're lucky. Yeah. I feel lucky that the main early childhood teacher who I work with um, actually values parent ed time. And I think that actually was improved one of maybe the only things that got improved um, with uh, COVID and having to do it online because she got to sit in on parenting because um, it was via Zoom and she stayed uh, and she got to see what we talk about what and what we do and realized, oh yeah, this is an important this is an important part of it because um, she's always only done the early childhood piece. So having a team where both parts are valued, I think is huge. I don't get to make any of the decisions, um, but my supervisor actually just today pulled me aside and asked me to talk with her after a class um, as she's trying to figure out a schedule for next year. So she very much is valuing my input, um, but I'm not making decisions, which I'm actually kind of glad for. It's she was talking about wishing she had a crystal ball. What will people sign up for? What will we have the staff for? Um, it was a lot of pressure to try to figure it out.
I'm spoiled in Minnetonka because the two early childhood teachers who are um, dedicated to ECFE time are also both parent educators. Um, so it's really wonderful to have them. Um, how about class prices? That was another thing, another question that came up, um, so and like, especially for yeah. sliding scale. So, like, like what kind of what's behind this little um, conversation I had um, in my program with someone the other day about, um, you know, it when parents sign up, you know, it's just on our system. They just choose the price that um, they want to pay, and that's always been my experience of both, you know. Um, teaching and as a parent. Um, and I, I think that's appropriate. Um, and just kind of there was two parts to sort of wonderings about this, wondering whether um, any other districts do it differently, um, whether parents who just choose zero um, know the importance of kind of financially supporting ECFE. And then the other part of it that we got talking about was um, you know, for those parents who are saying like, you know, this is my income level, choose zero, um, you know, is that a missed opportunity for connecting with them and, you know, hoping that they're aware of all of the resources and supports that might be available for their family? So just curious to know what um, it's looking like in other districts. We don't always know what scale they're on. I mean, sometimes parents will say, we need a full ride, and I'll be like, great. Um, and I usually Yeah, know. we wouldn't necessarily know. No, right. I mean, we don't wouldn't know either. Yeah. It's self, so online, when they register online, it's self-disclosed. But if they ask for a full or partial scholarship, then then I usually find out, which I don't love. I, I don't like, you know, it says in our catalog, please let us know. But people will always say, how do I get a scholarship? And I'm like, the number right here. I'm going to take a picture of this and set it up or send it to you so you guys can all see what ours looks like. I think it's really different district to district based on a lot of different factors, but um, I'll, I'll work on getting it attached here so you can see it. Um, this is a, a topic that's really I'm passionate about because I think access is so important. Um, but in St. Paul, I think that as part of the online sign up, they just ask them, you know, what can you pay? And they say, and I'm in my interview, they told me something like, it was a really high number. Don't quote me exactly, but it was something like 75% of families or well over 50% of families don't pay anything because we serve a lot of low-income families. Um, and so clearly they make it easy. You don't have to ask for a scholarship. You just choose what you can pay. And it's also, um, all the classes are full year, but the payments are divided in half. Um, and I think you can also do a pay as you go kind of thing. So it's just very accommodating to multiple incomes. And um, when I was in Hastings, it was kind of the opposite. Um, they would publish the highest price. Um, you know how on a sliding fee there'd be a price. They'd publish the highest price. And I'm like, don't you understand uh, for a family to think about $250 for a semester is just beyond the reach of any family making minimum wage, you know? And then you had to ask for a scholarship. Um, and so, a lot of families just would be like, oh, I can't afford that, and then not. So I think it can vary a lot, and the district has to be really accommodating. And what used to drive me crazy was, um, you know, the district gets the same funding for families, regardless of what they pay. So do you want these families here or not, right? So, and I know the fees matter, like, yes, they use the fees, and we need more funding. But at the same time, if we want families to be here, we have to accommodate the fact that um, even a $50 class for some families is really too much. I think we're somewhere in between those two places in Maplewood. Um, we have a few classes that are just free, so it doesn't matter how much money you make, you don't pay, that are infant class. Um, and I think that's partly wanting to draw new families in and they see what ECFE is and what it can do for them. And then hopefully the next year they'll sign up for walkers and talkers. Um, and our ELL 
our English language program, um, which is one day of ECFE and two days of English lessons uh, is free. So we have a few that just don't have any published costs. They just are free for everybody. Um, but I also think that you have to, um, you like, I think it's a combo. Like, like Jenny was saying for St. Paul, you have to like self pick what, what rate you can pay and then, um, pay it. But if you don't pay it, like, we'll give you a bill. <laughs> It'll be like, just a reminder, you haven't paid. And, my feelings on that are, are mixed because I feel like you want to be as accessible as possible. I feel passionately about that also, Jenny. Um, but I've also noticed that when you've paid money, even if it's only $25, like you're more invested, literally figuratively, you're more likely to come and participate in something um, that you had to give something for. Um, so there's some value in that, um, in, in feeling like you've paid for this, even if it's been a very small amount of money. Um, so I like people feeling like they've helped make this class possible, um, even if it was $10 or, you know, whatever it was. Yeah, I our, our sliding fee scale, I don't even think it says zero on it, but she has, a, the community ed director puts in a, sentence about, you know, if you can't afford or, you know, whatever it is, you know, um, that, that arrangements can be made with the family. We used to, um, in addition to publishing the sliding scale, uh, we used to have uh, a discount for families that had more than one child in the same class. So a set of twins, or if they had three kids in the same class, then they got a 50% dis discount on the other ones. And we didn't used to, we used to publish that we didn't charge for babies under nine months to come with their parent, you know, babies in arms, in other words, before they're mobile. Um, but I noticed that those two things got dropped from our, our, our brochure the last year or so. And I keep forgetting to ask, are they still offering that or not? Because I really don't know what parents are there. They're registering online and I really don't know what they're, what they're paying so. I'm pretty sure when I was in St. Paul as a parent, I paid, it was, it was like per adult, not, or per family, not per child, which is very different than in Maplewood and very much appreciated for me. But I, I don't know if I would have felt like I could afford it if I was paying for each kid. I think I had one year where I was bringing three kids. Um, and then the other years it was always two. So um, I remember being a little horrified. I had, this is many years ago, but hearing about Roseville at the time, because that's the nearest other district to me, where it was like, not only would I have had to pay for two separate ECFE classes to take my two children to, but I'd also have to pay for sibling care for each of those. It'd be like paying four times instead of paying once. So I really appreciated in St. Paul how accessible it was that it was like one cost and that it was the multi-age class that could bring both kids um, and it, that made it feel a lot more accessible. Jenny, really quick, before you go, click on this link. Um, I don't know how many of you know about this. Um, there is a, there's a proposal, just open it before you go. There's a proposal to move ECFE out from under the umbrella of MDE. And do yeah. we like that or not like that? I don't think it's a good thing. Because then we're not... Yeah. Yep. So this is probably, I mean, I messaged, I know everyone's like flabbergasted. Um, if so, it starts on page 35. So I just wanted you to see it before you left. Okay, so you can thank you. It. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Um, this is wildly unknown. Um, came to my attention this week. I sent a message to Susan Shorey, who is um, really um, super active with our legislative, our lobbyist, Amy Cook at the Capitol. Um, and I said, what is this? And she said, I said, do you know about this? And she said, yeah. Um, yeah, they want to move on a giant list of MDH, MDE, um, DCH, 
um, all these agencies to a children, youth, and family. They want to create a whole new umbrella for children, youth, and family. Special ed as well would be moved out from under this umbrella. Um, what does it mean for ECFE? Don't know. What does it mean if we are not under MDE anymore? Like, are are we required to be licensed teachers? I I don't know. So I just think it's really important for everyone to have this information, to look at it. Um, I'm assuming M. Manafi will have a statement pretty soon about it that kind of makes it a little more digestible. And then we can, um, we're already meeting with our, um, we're already meeting with our local um, rep um, in March about it. So yeah. Mm, great. That's good to know. Happened in Maryland, Maryland and teacher quality went down. That's well, terrific. And just as a note, the, where this was, I was involved with child care, sort of early childhood and, um, and child care subsidies and training of child care providers and, you know, that kind of thing. And it was over in the Department of Human Services or so, sort of social work, social welfare. So because it was a subsidy program. And so mm -hmm. they moved all subsidy programs you know, nutrition mm -hmm. subsidies, whatever. And so by having childcare and childcare quality mm -hmm. and the training of childcare providers, mm -hmm. and early childhood teachers and the whole teacher license, you know, kind of thing over there, mm -hmm. those people, those people, you know, aren't educators. They're, they're, they make sure that the trains keep running and, and people get their vouchers, right? And so, so just personally, I just, you know, people saw that the quality of healthcare went down because it was treated as a, as a subsidy program, not as a, a quality of life enhancement program. And, um, but the problem is, is that once that move happens, it, there will be hell to pay to get it moved back under education at some point. Well, and I, I mean, I think part of Walls's plan is he wants childcare to be more affordable and bless him because that is true. Childcare in this state is a disaster, but I don't know that this is the way to go about doing that. So for those of you who are watching, um, I think if you just Google, if you go to um, biennial, 2425 biennial budget, minnesota.gov and then type in or and then basically you'd be looking on page 35 to see a list of the agencies that would be switching to this dcyf something mm -hmm. committee of youth and families it sounds pretty on paper mm -hmm. that's what that i was going to say ellen like the, the sound of it sounds like oh, oh. We need more intention we need yeah. something that's intentionally focused on early childhood and it, families still be under the umbrella of education in the state it needs to not be some separate thing no um, right and yeah. if we're not if we're not under mde then the requirement this is where my brain is first the requirement to be a licensed educator in the state of minnesota goes bye-bye i would not be surprised that and that's the first thing i thought of is like okay well if we're not if yeah, that's my first thing. Mm -hmm. So then what happens to all of us with our licenses? Right. Are we not va valuable? Are we not important? What happens to us on who are on teacher contracts? Right. What does that happen for our, I mean, this is gonna, this is gonna be interesting. So I just wanted you guys to be aware, talking about it, sharing it with your colleagues. Yep. Um, and like, I don't know, I, I don't know if I should share, share it on friends and family ed. Cause I don't really know what it means. I just think people should be aware. I'm just going to post it. Yeah. And Al, it. Actually, Alan, I had that question when I post the video, I wondered about adding your PDF link in the notes. Yeah, go ahead. Do so. Yep. Okay. Add the link. I'm going to post this on friends and family ed, just so people under like, because my boss was like, yeah, what, where did this come from? And when I was talking with Susan, she said, maybe this is why the legislature has been like this when, you know, trying to give us two full-time staff at MDE because they knew this was coming down the pike. I don't know. I mean, I also wonder how much this maybe is being influenced by staffing issues and the max, mass exodus of teachers from the profession. Like, if there's more thought behind there of being able to hire people who aren't teachers to do this work. Oh, because Lord. 
I wonder if that's one of the factors. I didn't even think about that. That's gross. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I'm sorry to put, I'm sorry to like this. I was really in a tizzy about this on Wednesday when I got the information. I'm, I'm over it now. So I'm sorry if I ruined your Friday. I'm on a show of hands. Did I make your day worse? <laughs> Crappy to happy. Did I ruin it? Here's yeah. I docked too. Sorry, Jenny. I forgot. So anyway, oh. <laughs> um, so be aware. I think it's just good to be aware. And the more aware we are, the more we can talk to our um people in government and you know, see. But this is a big sweep. This is oh, a it is, it totally is. And actually, huge. I'm appreciative that you brought it up because I think that it opens up conversation like never before. Yeah. Right. You know, because as long as there's sort of the silo of MBE, then there's the, well, why don't we do this? And why don't we have this? And why, you know, and then it's sort of like beating your head up against a, a wall. But when there's a radical shift, right, of creating a whole new unit, and what does that mean to be out of NBE? I mean, then, mm. yeah. So I think that it's a, it's a very good conversation mm -hmm. that, again, is, I think, very well intentioned. Um, but it definitely can have quality ramifications mm -hmm. uh, down the line. When in my mind, there are plenty of ways to enhance quality under the education umbrella. Like mm -hmm. we've been fighting or an, and advocating for more family engagement and to see children's learning through as a much more lifelong developmental thing and not third grade or, you know, so yeah, anyway. But thank you. I'm especially yeah. horrified by the idea of special ed not being under early childhood special ed not being under education. Like that blows my mind. Well, yeah. and would this be, do you think this would create a route for districts to say, we're not going to do we don't have the space for anymore? Um, and we're not going to do it anymore. We're not going to we're not going to offer ECF anymore. We're not going to offer preschool anymore because it's just taking up space in our buildings and we have to build because I caught when I th some of you know when I first joined your group it was because I was asking about um, you know their remodeling space to be an early childhood learning center it would be preschool and um, kindergarten in a former hospital in Albany and it keeps getting back to me that anytime we say, well, we, we really need to have this for early child to be best practice for early childhood and ECFE space. And they say, well, this space has to be uh, usable for every, any grade level that we might need to put in there. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking we, now we, we have been the most mobile, the most mobile department. We were in a dentist's office, the basement of a dentist's office for a while. <laughs> Um, so it, we're not even, it's not even built yet. And we're already talking about how we're not going to be there. So this, this news kind of is starting to make that those comments make a little bit more sense. Um, they have our newest teachers on the committee for giving input on this space and have not included our most experienced teachers, early childhood teachers. So I'm kind of wondering. Now, thank you for sharing this, Ellen. Yeah, it maybe took me down just a bit. <laughs> it's bittersweet, but you know, I I don't like to be aware. Surprised. I like to be, I like to be prepared and aware. So I'm gonna post it on friends and family ed here in just a little bit. Glad to be aware. Yeah, thanks. Yep. Yeah, and encourage the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's also a sort of a danger anytime with social media of people just sort of hunkering down and you know, just like interpreting it as it is when this is so new that, you know, Susan then sort of opened the door for Susan to share more information and like, you know, what do we know? What can we do? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting too, because what does this mean to the March advocacy day? Right. And mm -hmm. all of that. So interesting. Um, well, we're past time. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm. um and um best wishes to everyone especially becca thank you again for sharing today and um we'll as ebby said you know we'll all hold you in our thoughts and mm -hmm. prayers, including audrey so there she is yeah <laughs> dogs are people too they they their hearts are big and and they care for humans so um 
Okay, everybody, have a good role model for us. Thank you. Happy Valentine's. Yeah. Yeah. Bye, everybody. (laughs) Take care.